In this video, we're going to finally look at um, electron configuration. And so um, without further ado, let's get into it. This is one of the more important topics, at least in the early part of the course. Um, unfortunately, the way some folks learn it isn't always consistent with the most physically, I guess, correct approach. So lecture 10, electron configuration. Before we get started, um, there are three principles to know. Okay, and um, the first one is the off baugh principle. In the off baugh principle, um, what, uh, what this principle teaches us is that electrons fill the lowest energy orbitals first. Now, without having a discussion of energetics, which is coming, um, what we need to settle with is the fact that our lowest energy orbitals are going to be our lower shell orbitals. So what this really refers to is lower shell orbitals. And in addition to that, we do S, then P, then D, then F. Now I know there's some alarms going off in some people's heads as they know that there's a break in this where this little trend of S, then P, then D, then F doesn't work. But in general, if we look at a single shell, like if we just look at the fourth shell, excuse me while I wipe my glasses, um, if you look at just the fourth shell, uh, the F sub, uh, excuse me, the F orbitals within this, the fourth shell are higher in energy than the D, which is higher than the P, which is higher than the S. There's a little bit of a, a shell kind of overlap that we have to deal with, and we won't really deal with it too much in this course, but it's something to be aware of. Okay, so we have to fill the lowest shell first, and we have to fill the lowest, and, and within each shell, we have to um, start with the S, then move on to the P, then the D, then the F. And then the second principle, if off bar is first, the second principle is a very important principle to bring up, but it's something we've been discussing actually already, and that's the Pauli exclusion principle. And what this suggests is that any orbital can hold only two electrons. And these two electrons, to be most precise, um, are of opposite spins. I'm going to write that. And I'm going to write the word quantum in front of spin. It's a bit redundant for those that study this to, to put um, uh, quantum in front of the word spin. That's sort of implied. Anyway, what this tries to remind us is that the important thing for us right now with the Pauli exclusion principle is that we can only put two electrons into these orbitals. We've been discussing that already. Now there's some deep quantum mechanics in all of this. Quantum mechanics underlies a lot of the nature of the atom, in particular, those low mass electrons. So there's going to be some things, some parts of quantum mechanics that are just beyond the scope of where we're at right now. And I don't want us to worry about them. But, and that's one of these um, kind of rears its head with the Pauli exclusion principle. In addition, uh, Pauli also notes that these spins must be one up and one down within each particular orbital. Now that's not something that we, we, we should worry about at this point, but two electrons, okay. Now the third one, which is an important one, it's not always taught, in, um, taught so explicitly in high school, but it's a very important rule for understanding how atoms sort of work, and that's Hund's rule. And this is one where uh, people don't really, people that have had a good high school or high school chemistry uh, experience will say to me, hey, you're, I'm learning electron configuration differently than I was taught in high school. And that comes down to Hund's rule. And Hund's rule, uh, what, this say, what this says is that electrons that can exist in degenerate orbitals will 
will spread out. Okay, now what this is referring to is let's say we've got some orbitals. I'm going to show these orbitals as line and lines, and this is going to be our 2x orbital, our 2py orbital, and our 2pz orbital. So these are p orbitals within the second shell, and we know that p orbitals exist as actually three suborbitals, each parallel to an axis of the Cartesian coordinate. Now let's say I'm going to put two electrons in here. Well, no, let's make it three. So I'm going to put in here, I'll make that red for myself. So I'm going to take three electrons and put them in. Now each of these orbitals, which are shown by the lines, can hold two electrons each. So I could just be like, okay, I'm gonna put an electron, I'm gonna go back to black, in case you don't have pens lying around. I could go electron, electron, electron. Okay, so, so far, ignoring Hun's rule, I haven't broken any rules. Um, because I've put two electrons in each of the orbitals. If I tried to stack three, I would violate the Pauli exclusion principle. And this is all assuming that the 1s and the 2s orbitals are already filled, which would be consistent with the off-baw principle. Okay, so Hun's rule or Hun's principle would not like this. This would, we would put an x through this and say this violates Hun's I suppose it's a rule instead of a principle. So this is not good. What we want to do is spread the electrons out across each of those suborbitals. They're degenerate, which means they're the same energy. The electron doesn't care if it's in any one of those three. So if it doesn't care and we have three of them, let's spread them out. Minimize electron-electron repulsion because the like charges will repel each other. So we spread the electrons out. We have the 2px, the 2py, and the 2pz. This is Hun's rule, and we say we're going to put these electrons spread out across each of the three suborbitals. Now, it doesn't matter which electron went into any one of those orbitals so long as they were spread out. They're all the same energy. They're all degenerate. So this is, um, this follows, this arrangement of electrons follows Hun's rule. Okay, now one thing, uh, since we have the time, I guess, because this is a pre-recorded lecture, we could say what about a four electron system in the 2p orbitals? So if we wanna fill the 2p orbitals with four electrons, there are actually three, and I like this word, degenerate or of equal energy possibilities. So if we have our three lines, we have 2px, 2py, 2pz, we could go electron, 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 electron. So we put two in the first one, which previously was the 2px orbital, one in the second one, and one in the third one, but we could just as easily put two in the second one or two in the third one. Three possibilities. All of those are degenerate orientation or arrangements, I guess, of the electrons, and they don't violate Hun's rule, the Pauli exclusion principle, or the off bar principle. Okay, so those are three principles we need to know before we get into what's called the electron configuration. So let's define that. We're already seeing bits and pieces of electron configuration as we studied, or I, I guess just sort of examined these three critical rules and principles. The electron configuration is simply the arrangement of all electrons in an atom. And if you know the electron configuration, you can answer questions like, what orbitals do the electrons reside in? Now to do this successfully, you need to apply the three principles, the off bar principle, the, the Pauli exclusion principle and Hun's rule as you look at how we're going to put all of the electrons into our system. Okay, so let's start and look at some examples. So what I would say is I would write this as a task on a test or problem set or whatever. 
provide an electron configuration for, I would provide some atoms. So we've got a carbon atom, which tells us something about the number of protons. I put some atomic mass up here. That tells us something about the number of neutrons. And we'll see in a second that's not super relevant. I'm going to then follow with the charge. So we have a total charge of zero. It's a neutral element. What we first have to do is answer the question for each of these examples, how many electrons do we have total? So in total, how many electrons are in this carbon 12 with a neutral charge? We've actually looked at that and that's six electrons total. So we're gonna put six electrons into our system. Well, what we do is we say, the first one, we could, uh, as we get started here, we could just kind of list, we've got first, second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth. What I need to do is just know the location of each of these. The first electron is going to go in the 1s orbital. It's the lowest energy orbital. It's closest to the nucleus, which makes it lower in energy, and it can hold two electrons. So we can put that first one right away into that empty 1s orbital. Then we can put the second one into the 1s orbital. Again, each orbital can hold two electrons, so we could put two in those 1s orbitals. Now, as we said earlier, the s orbitals were lower in energy than the p orbitals. So we're going to fill the s orbitals before we get to the p orbitals. And so after we get through the 1s orbital and it's filled up with its two electrons, we're gonna bump up to the second shell, but only fill the, the, the 2s orbital in this case. So only the s orbital in that second shell. Now for the fifth and the sixth electrons, we need to not only follow Aufbau principle and the Pauli exclusion principle, we need to look at Hund's rule. We need to spread these electrons apart because we could put them each into two p orbitals, but we wanna designate that they're going to go in separate 2p orbitals. That is one, for example, could go into the 2px. One could go into the 2py. All of those, um, if, we, if we wanted to change it, and instead of putting one into 2px, we put one into z and one into y, or one into x and one into z, or one into, yeah, I guess those are the possibilities. Um, it doesn't matter. They're all degenerate possibilities. Okay, so these, what I've provided here is the um, orbitals that each electron would exist in. But this is not the electron configuration. Instead, the electron configuration takes on the following format. What we do is we say 1s2, 2s2, 2px1. 2py1. And then I like to make it a habit of providing the zero occupied suborbital that's degenerate with the px and the py. You could leave it off, I suppose, if you wanted to. Okay, so this is the format. What we see here are a few things. First of all, there's a one in front of the first s orbital, then a two in front of the second s orbital and the various p suborbitals. This is the shell number that we were looking at. So allowing us to tell the difference between the s orbital in the first shell and the s orbital in the second shell. There's another number and it's a superscripted number and that is number one or two or even zero. This is the number of electrons in each of those orbitals. The other thing that gets communicated here is the orbital type. And within the orbital type, whenever we can label suborbital type, we should. So label your suborbitals. Okay, so that is a correct electron configuration. 1s2, 2s2, 2px1, 2py1, 2pz0. What does an incorrect electron configuration look like? This is where there's some friction 
because people disagree with me. They learned this was the way to do it in high school, but we leave out some critical details. So in this approach, what we do is we are simplifying a bit too much an important suborbital, or excuse me, an important orbital that contains suborbitals. So this is incorrect right now because we could say, where are the suborbitals? Now, I'll be honest with you. I'm a reasonable person, okay? If you've got an electron configuration that spans forever, like you're going up into the fourth shell, I get it. You have to write 2p6 for the sake of abbreviation. For us though, we're gonna work with a lot of elements that we actually don't transcend beyond that second shell. So it's always just 1s2, excuse me, 1s orbitals, 2s orbitals, 2px, 2py, 2pz. And it's really important for us to understand the chemistry, to realize that the electrons that exist in that second shell are spread out across four orbitals, the s and the three sub p orbitals, as opposed to two orbitals, s and p, just conglomerating the p's together. That's really important. Okay, um, that's a lot of the lecture content we have. So I'm gonna go through two more examples just so we can kind of see this. Let's do 23 in a, and let's make this uh, plus one. Plus one. No, 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 let's make it zero and then we'll do the plus one second. So we'll make it zero, okay? So we've got, um, in this case, Sodium, checking my periodic table is element 11, 11 P plus, and 11 E minus, 11 electrons total. It's the first step, count your electrons. We know they're equal because we have a neutral charge, no imbalance. So with 11 electrons, we're at 1s2, 2s2, 2px, 2py, 2pzs. Okay, so if you look at this, we're at four electrons between the, the s orbitals, so we have how many left we have to get to 11. So we're at seven left, which means we can go ahead and fill the entirety of each of the P suborbitals. So I'm just gonna put two, two, two. We're gonna jump up to the next lowest orbital and that's going to be an S orbital in the third shell. We only have one electron to fill it. If we wanna worry about cation, so let's do a cation example. Cations and anions are fair games when we look at electron configuration. But all we're doing there is changing our total electron count. That's the first step. Figure out your total electron count. Out total electrons first. That's the only thing that gets changed when we look at cations. Okay, so sodium would then be if we make it a positive charge, we have 11 protons. And remember, if we have a cation, we have an imbalance where there's more protons than electrons to get to a plus one charge, which I'll write the one in this case. Sometimes we just write the plus. If I get to a plus one charge, that tells me I've got one more proton than electron. You could think about it as we're gonna see, as though we've just lost an electron through. What's that process? Oxidation. Okay, so if we look at this, we're at 1s2, 2s2, next is 2px. To write these out. I have space for six and I've only used four, so I need six. I'm just going to fill them up. Okay, so sodium as a cation gets us to 1s2, 2s2, 3s2, so on and so forth. Okay, we could um, do, let's do chlorine. We'll do a big one to kind of round out with. So that's 35. Cl, we'll start with the neutral element. That's element 17, so 17 protons and 17 electrons. Okay, 1s2, 2s2, 2px, 2py. I get it, I know why your high school teacher told you just to aggregate this together to make it 2p6. But we're learning how about orbitals, so. We go 1s2, 2s2, 2px, 2py, 2pz, each with two, that puts us at 10 electrons. As we break into the third shell, we still have seven electrons left. 3px, 3py, 3pz. Now two of these 3p suborbitals get two electrons 
and then one of them gets one electron. It doesn't matter which arrangement you put them in, it really doesn't. They're all, there's nothing about Hun's rule that says fill the X before you fill the Y. They're all degenerate. And the reality is because you kind of float around in space. So what was X, you flip the roll the molecule now becomes Y. The same thing could be said for Z. So it doesn't matter, but I'm just gonna go ahead and go X, Y, Z. Okay. And then we'll close out with an anion example if we do 35 Cl minus one, and this is an anion. Now what this does is this is going to change our electron count by one, but in the opposite direction of the cation. With an anion, we have an imbalance of protons and electrons favoring the electrons. So we're up to 18 electrons in this case. So what that looks like is, sure, 1s2, 2s2, 2px2, 2py2, 2pz2. 3s2, oh boy, just run out of the room. 3px2, 3py2, 3pz2. Gotta have fun. Okay, just kind of roll around the side of the page there. So what we were looking at uh, in this lecture was a very important topic uh, in this introductory slash review, whatever you want to call it. This not not the typical kind of organic chemistry lectures, but that very important topic is electron configuration. We have to be able to see an atom, count the number of electrons that are in this atom, and then know where they would be positioned. That is what orbitals they're going to reside in. And to do that, we need to follow those three principles, know the three principles, know how to do this for any atom. Re recognize though, I'm not gonna take you all the way up into the fourth shell, okay? I'm not gonna take you into the D orbitals, the three D orbitals, for example. I'm not gonna do that. I wanna stick with S and P orbitals, first, second, and third shell, but not the D orbitals within that third shell. Okay.